Okay. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to um, our weekly community calls. Um, so we've got a couple special guests here today. Um, so uh, Lonis and Theo um, actually had reached out to me um, on Twitter and they've uh, been noticing a little bit of um, this kind of DSI, uh, decentralized science uh, buzz that's been picking up. And um, a few teams have actually been uh, kind of pushing um, a lot of their um, kind of organization through uh, a platform called Dwork, where you can um, organize a bunch of different uh, bounties, uh, have the community get involved, and then get compensated for um, the value that they're bringing to um, to your platform. And so uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Lonis and Theo, who um, had talked to us a little bit, um, me and Patrick, uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, we thought it'd be great to have them give a demo of Dwork, see what kind of capabilities there are, what things we can leverage. Um, and, and they said that they would be happy to do a, a short like Q&A with us as well. So um, without further ado, I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over to them. Yeah, thanks so much for, for having me and for having us. Um, I, I very much apologize for the background of us. Uh, I'm at a so for a party here in Amsterdam, where this is the East Conference. Um, but I, I'm, I'm super happy to, to be here and, and in chat. Um, so some brief background, and then I'll just go through the, the product with you and get your feedback and thoughts. Um, so yeah, like many here, I was previously DAO contributor myself, uh, contributed for two months at the city DAO, and this DAO that bought land in Wyoming, uh, where I was basically the first engineering contributor. And basically while contributing there, we kind of felt clearly the problems we had around uh, managing our tasks and bounties in a like, transparent way um, and efficient way. And also from the contributor perspectives, um, the problems people had around building their uh, Web3 profile, basically, with our, uh, with our work history. Um, so that's basically what the work is an attempt at solving. Um, and I'll just share my screen here now. Uh, so we basically started working on this around around four or five months ago. Uh, we launched publicly around um, 10, 11 weeks ago. Um, and uh, yeah, since then we've become what I believe is the largest um, task and bounty platform for DAOs. So we have more than 6,000 traded tasks and bounties um, and more than 7,000 signed up uh, users. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanna make sure, uh, do, anyone, do everyone hear me at least okay? Or is it a complete uh, catastrophe? That's good, it's good. We hear you. All right. Awesome. Um, yeah, so just to give you a sense on a very high level, we see two different kinds of use cases for DWP. We see, or on the, it's of course a gray scale, but some DAOs use it more for task tracking and some use it more for uh, bounty tracking and, and bounty management. So if we look at this DAO, for instance, for using DWP, they didn't have a good way of managing their bounties. Um, using DWP, they paid out uh, hundreds of bounties for everything from writing code to doing Discord moderation and uh, marketing. Um, so if we look at another DAO, like OpenDAO, they have very few bounties. So they mostly use the work as a form of, as a way of tracking their internal work um, in a transparent way that integrates deeply with, uh, with, uh, with GitHub and Discord. Um, and also allows contributors to build their, their profile so if we look at this person, for instance, here he has his profile with the work he's completed uh, across the house. Um, so your work history becomes this global state rather than this local state uh, in the DMs, uh, for instance. Um, so that, that's on a, on a high level. Um, of, of course, um, uh, just to give you a sense of like how you set it up so far, Anyone can basically go here. Um, I just paste the link as, as well to see um, the board that's been set up for research hub so far. Um, there you can basically see a bunch of projects. Um, and on the landing page, you can also see this list of open tasks um, where, uh, yeah, you can basically submit work and get paid based on, based on the quality of the work. And you can also apply to claim, claim uh, bounties to what them. Um, so let me recommend people do that, earn some um, research hub tokens and um, um, yeah, and build their profiles. 
and then just to give you a super quick sense uh, of like the back, uh, how it looks like uh, uh, on the back end, uh, it basically easily can create this kind of projects that are like part of the of the DAO. Um, and you can create these from scratch, or you can import um, ex existing stuff from Notion or Trello, or use um, the GitHub sync, which basically allows you to uh, be in one on one sync with GitHub. So if you create a task in, in DWork, it creates an issue in GitHub. And when you merge the code, it, it uh, moves the task to done in DWork and so forth. So you can basically use them in tandem. Um, and here you can basically have a task like rep uh, 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 paper x. Um, and then uh, um, you can basically uh, add a bounty to this task if you wish to. So you can basically say, I want to add a payment method here. Um, and I can basically pay with the safe as usual um, so for most EVM networks. And uh, here you can just grab your Ignosis safe contract address um, and connect there. Um, and then choose which tokens to pay with. Um, of course, you'd want to pay usually with your own DAO specific tokens as you've already set up. You can also pay with NFTs. Um, and uh, yeah, basically attach a bounty here. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if you have a volatile token, it might make sense to also pay to USD. Um, so you can be sure of the value when you get paid out. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, the, the thing I would, and then when we create a task, we realized that we need to choose a gaining option. So basically we can do, we have four different options and, and this is like one of the critical uh, ways we add value for those that have more, um, granular and different ways of working than, of course, traditional companies. Um, so you can, of course, choose to uh, manually assign yourself or others in the team. Um, but you can also um, have this application process where any, anyone can apply. Um, and that's, if we look at the boundaries you put out so far, we see that this task, for instance, it's an applied application task. So here I need to apply and say, uh, uh, um, so I can basically apply, and then on the other end, uh, they I can basically get accepted. If, uh, yeah, if my work was good or whatever, or yeah, if, if my profile looks, looks good. Um, so that's one kind of bounty. Um, the second kind of bounty would be the multiple submissions, uh, which is more permissionless. So you just allow anyone to just submit, do the work, and get paid based on the quality. Um, so you see here that you have a few of those bounties as well, where I don't really need to apply. I can just say, here's uh, the, uh, the work. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can like attach a, a link or a PDF or uh, yeah, an arbitrary file really. So you can, you can do that. Um, and then the third kind of bounty, which I would, I would uh, encourage you to try out is basically using Discord roles for the gating. So it's a combination. So it's basically the, what you basically do is that we import the Discord roles you have in your server currently to the work uh, and allow you to do permissioning based on those to allow for more uh, autonomous work structures. So hopefully we'll get this to load. Um, so basically what, what it will allow you to do is that you get rid of this application process and you'll still just be able to say that if you have a certain Discord role, then you'll just be able to work on this task and no strings attached basically. But this will trust you because you have this Discord role and uh, yeah, you effectively stake your Discord role in actually going through and completing the bounty and not just abandon it. Because then you might, uh, might not keep your, uh, your Discord role. If that makes sense. 
So here we've now imported the disco rules, and here I can now say that if you like a gold row, admin, uh, dev level three, then you'll just be able to claim this task and work on it. Um, uh, because we trust you, you have these roles. Uh, and of course, if you don't have these roles, uh, then you can still apply to the test. Um, does that make sense? Or are there any questions or thoughts or, or feedback around that, that concept? So I have a question for the, for the multiple submission. So basically, sure. I posted a bounty there uh, last week. And basically, I wanted to reward everyone that completed the, the, the task. Right. Um, but like I, I got like two submission. Uh, so it was like multiple submissions. So you didn't really have to apply. You could just like submit your work. But then sure. when I got into like the approve kind of like uh, section, I approved yeah. one. I wanted to approve also the other, but that like wasn't possible. So yeah, yeah. OK. So you can't really like pay out everyone that applied. Is there a way to pay out everyone that, that, that kind of like did the task or? Or what? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, so yeah, there is a way. It is a bit of a workaround, but when there is a way, so let's let's do that. We make this a multiple submission bounty, and then we'll just invite a contributor here. Um, and here I can just say, "Here's my work." So I've now made the submission. Um, yeah, let's open it with another account as well. Um, so basically what you would do is that you'll just, uh, what, what basically you would, do, you, you would do is you, you would do this workaround by, by assigning people to the subtasks. So you would basically create a winner uh, and, or like not even winner, but just, uh, just first, uh, payouts and uh, yeah okay and then you assign each contribution to correct exactly okay yeah great okay yeah thank you that's it's kind of useful because we do like we could I, I i see that happening in the future again like we kind of like put out a bounty for many people to be completed and want to pay yeah. out everyone so yeah thank you that's that's great awesome Hey, Lonis, I was wondering if you can maybe touch on a little bit on um, kind of the idea of uh, batch payout. So I know Ethereum fees, which is what our token is running on, are kind of high sometimes. Um, so yeah. uh, how to go about like the batch payouts and uh, maybe also touch on a little bit of um, like how the Gnosis safe would be involved. So if we end up wanting to transfer um, ERC20 research coin, um, like how that, that mechanic sure. works would be the safe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so basically, let's just repeat a few tasks here. Uh, I'll just assign ourselves to both for now. And so what we can do at the end of the week or at the end of the sprint or whatever is that we can batch pay all, all the bounties at once. And then we will basically, it will basically just be the transaction cost of, of, of of one, one transaction. Um, so if you're a signer, you can just initiate the transaction from here. Um, sign it here. Um, so now it's processing. And then the folks in the multi-sig will just go and sign as they always do in the transactions queue. Um, so here we see less than a minute to go. And then we can execute these two bounties here, action one and action two. But they are bundled into one. So that's how, how that would how that would work. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, kind of a, a big one for at least on like the end of like the admins who like want to organize and like be able to pay out, you know, with minimal fees. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, does anyone else have, have any questions for Lonis while we, we have him around?
Yeah, if if not, uh, Lonis and Theo, thank you guys so much. I know you're you're out in, in Amsterdam right now for ETH Amsterdam. So if you want to get going, uh, yeah, feel free to and, and enjoy your time over there. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, um, yeah uh, we're in your this, in your server. So if there are any like questions or thoughts or feedback, please just tag either me or CEO and uh, we'll answer ASAP. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank guys. you guys. Thank you. Bye. All right. Um, so yeah, again, if you guys have um, any questions regarding that, um, you can ask, um, you know, either Lonis or Theo, they're, they're floating around in some of our servers, or feel free to, to message me as well. Um, so if there's no other uh, questions about that, um, we can move on to the next topic, which is going to be um, kind of this um, idea of like, what are the pros and cons that you guys have felt with like Discord versus um, Slack? And um, maybe kind of what are some of your ideas uh, moving forward on where to whether to keep a lot of the activity occurring on Slack or shift um, into Discord and have Slack be kind of a broader, more announcement type of style. Um, so I'm interested to hear everybody's thoughts on that. Yeah, Edwin. <clears throat> I don't know. I think Discord makes more sense when you have a lot more people. Mm -hmm. So I can play way more channels. Um, and a lot of the channels, like the basic channels are set up for things uh, that larger groups of people might have questions about, I think. I don't know. That's just my sense of it. But I haven't yeah. used that. Either, so. That's definitely how I think as well. I think like the customizability on Discord and the scalability for it uh, makes a lot of sense. We can house a lot of the video ch channels and conferences and calls and stuff in there as well. And I think it'd be a little bit more of a centralized location. There's, we have the option to do support tickets as well, which I think helps organize some of the bug reports or some of the other issues editors have had that have just been kind of DMing some people and we have to reroute them somewhere else. And it'll be a nice, more central location for things like that. So if we want to uh, slowly transition into Discord, what do you think it's best to do like as a practice with Slack? Like just keeping Slack, maybe trying to restrict the content that we put on Slack, just like maybe the most important announcement so that people are kind of like, you know, we, we can still get the updates on Slack and then kind of like follow Discord if we want to get involved into working groups and so on. Also like on, on a side note for, for this like working groups and stuff, um, I just want to remind you that it's really important that you uh, all like introduce yourself in the dedicated channel so we can basically know what you want to do, what are your, you know, your skills, what do you, uh, you think, how you think you could contribute to, to, to research up with the, the different activities. So as you said, now it's like, we're, we don't have a lot of people. So maybe, you know, Slack is even like uh, easier uh, to use for just because we used it for like the past five, six months, but as more people will flow in and maybe just use uh, Discord for working groups and so on, it might make sense to shift completely into Discord and kind of like use Slack uh, just for really important like updates for maybe editors that don't really want to get into Discord. Yeah, and I think if we just, if someone just <clears throat> consistently like rerouted people from Slack to Discord, I think that'd probably do the trick. <clears throat> So it makes sense to you. Makes sense to you also to kind of like only marketize Discord. Like whenever you get into a call and people like kind of ask you, "Hey, where, where where can people reach you out?" Should we like tell like both options? Should we just like mention Discord? What do you What do you think it's it's better? Because right now we have a lot of activity on Slack, a little bit less in Discord, but I kind of see that in the future this this roles kind of like swap. So it's good that we already start to redirect people directly on Discord, because in that way we'll have to reroute less people later. <clears throat> this is definitely true since we're going to be adding a bunch more editors in the not too distant future. So we might as well just start getting used to it, rerouting people there. And um, yeah. So okay, one so. question I have: um, 
do you think it's possible to just say, hey, everybody, we're moving completely over to Discord? Like, do you think there's going to be any, like, pushback from editors? Like, do you think anyone would just not want to use Discord at all? Because um, I kind of think we should just move over completely and, like, do a concerted effort to do it. Yeah, I agree. Just easiest to just, like, push everyone off. <laughs> Yeah. Is from like the from the side of the um like i guess kobe and patrick and thomas like from your end i know you guys have been on like the bug reports all go to slack and things like that are you guys fine with like a shift fully into discord would that would that make your guys's life easier as well uh i think so i like slack but it's mostly for convenience we have our channels we communicate it's nice but if everyone is on, it just sucks if we have like two different platforms. So we can make the shift to Discord. It's the same thing. No problem. Okay. Okay. And then uh, Nathan, <laughs> I hope your hand went up. Yeah. I, I By the way, I, I'm completely on board with the shift to Discord. I, I, I'm just trying to, I was just trying to think of, you know, is there any possible reason why you wouldn't want to do that? And um, just, just mainly just to, to play devil's advocate for a second. Um, and I was just thinking, maybe is there some hypothetical argument that some, and let's just say, you know, elderly professors would find if, if they did make the discovery of Research Hub, wanted to get involved in the mission, find something like Slack a bit more accessible than Discord? I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's not that there's any reason why they shouldn't find Discord accessible. It's just, I can just see that happening. I don't know why. Well, Slack has fewer options. So it's less confusing. I think some people use like Slack within their labs just for like professional communication too. So it's kind of like they're already there, probably semi-familiar. Yeah, that, that's right, Patrick. That's sort of what I was alluding to. I think Slack is seen as quite a professional tool. And then for whatever reason, in some circles, Discord might not be seen that way. It is definitely simple, but it's also less like kind of interactive. Like there's so many things that you can do, do on Discord. It's crazy. Like with, like with, with Jeff, we like set up, let's say, four or five bots that do stuff for us. And they're just like so convenient, honestly like super convenient so uh so yeah i see that but i also see the point that you know i was using that for my lab in the us we're using slack so i kind of like feel that yeah i want to piggyback on what nathan said essentially with like i actually do prefer slack but overall i prefer having one channel over two which is the reason why i fully support like a shift to discord but like for me, I've always seen Discord as something that, like, for example, most of my friends use it to play, like, video games. Like, my name on Discord is not, like, a professional name. I'm actually already considering changing it because of, like, Research Hub. Like, my name is a little bit silly on Discord, and I feel like a lot of people's names are silly on Discord. Um, I don't typically have my Discord notifications on because I have friends in, like, you know, who just, like, chat in it about random crap, like, again, like, throughout the day, whereas, like, Slack is all professional. So I think that, like, at least for me, it it's going to change my discord habits, which is fine. Um, but like, I think that's kind of where we are stuck where discord is definitely seen as less professional. Yeah. On, on, on that note, Lynn, a couple of things for that. You can, um, one thing is you can actually change your nickname within a server. Um, so your overall oh, name, really? yeah, whatever, but you can just change the nickname inside the research hub. Um, okay, so I'll that, definitely do that. Yeah. And then another thing too, is they actually pushed um, an update recently where you can just like in Twitter, you can switch through accounts. So if you want to have an account where you want to like, you know, have fun with your friends and play games, and then another account that's maybe a more professional Discord account, um, you can seamlessly switch um, between those accounts very easily now. Okay, awesome. I was not aware of that. So I'll definitely look into that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I think, Ricardo, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I mean, I was just like trying to answer the, like the two questions that you that you answered. Uh, but also, something else that I wanted to say, and I think this is important, at least for, for me, most of the DSI, actually, all of the DSI communities are in Discord. So if we're looking into like kind of like integrating into that flow, into that, you know, kind of like movement, uh, I think it's important to also be able to cross communicate with other, uh, you know, DAOs and communities. Also, the professors who are going to be trying to the, the first adapter professor professor is not going to be the old conservative ones, right? They're going to come in after the younger 
more experimental professors have come in and be like, oh, you know, you can benefit I mean, from, from this, this platform. Some of, them might, some of them might only use research hub, honestly. Like, I see that happening. Like, I only use the platform. I don't want to talk to other people. It's, it's, it's totally fine. Like, you, you just want to upload papers, do the conversation, just use research hub as a platform. And then there's other people like, I don't know, us, for example, that want to like chat and exchange, you know, uh, information, comments with other people. So we might as well, but I, I totally second your point. Like the people that we're looking at are most probably going to be fine with Discord and others more traditional are just going to probably use the, the platform itself. Yeah, I think it makes sense to to try and move people over to Discord, like make a concerted effort and then like just be conscious. Like if some people are like, hey, I'm not going to contribute because this isn't Slack. But yeah, I, I think you're right where most of the professors who would be contributing and like trying to earn bounties and stuff like they probably play like World of Warcraft, you know, and they know Discord. So, <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I think we're not probably not going to lose out on like the Harvard MIT professor because you know, we're using Discord instead of Slack. So I think it's cool to start moving over. I can, uh, uh, Jeff, I'll coordinate with you on how to best do it, but like I can start to message the Slack group and try and encourage people to move over. Okay, yeah, that'll be perfect. And um, like, I think it could be like kind of like a slow thing that maybe ramps up a little bit later, maybe over the course of the next couple of weeks or something like that. Um, so it's not just like an abrupt take, hey, everyone, we're done. Um, but yeah, that sounds good, Patrick. Totally. Um, and actually, on that note, I'll pass it back to you. Um, so, because the next topic we have here is going to be um, so these micro uh, research coin um, kind of grants um, that Patrick had had floated the idea around to me um, last week through message. Um, and so, uh, Patrick, if you want to um, kind of elaborate on some of those things. Yeah, totally. So, one thing I'm really excited about with Research Hub is basically the ability to publish uh, micro publications, for lack of a better word. So, scientific content that's not in the form of a scientific paper, kind of like smaller bits of research outputs. And so um, I always thought it would be like pretty incredible if we could somehow start to like, I guess, generate a database of single experiments where like people just get one experimental result, share the methods for how it was done and then the results and maybe like one figure to make it look cool. Um, and so one of the things that we can do now, um, thanks to like all the hard work that's gone into setting up the Uniswap marketplace, is we could give like kind of micro grants in RSC to researchers, like in the size of like 300 to $500 USD, something that won't cause like significant slippage on Uniswap, but will allow like a grad student to run like a cool experiment and then like type up the methods they used and share it uh, on Research Hub as an ELN post. And so this to me is like very cool, like for two reasons. One is that we'll have original content. Well, one, we'll be like supporting people actually making science, which is a gigantic step in my mind. And like there'll be original content being shared to Research Hub in a format that like, I don't know, you can really like share it in many other places. Um, so to me, that's very cool. And then the second thing is to start to show precedent that you can fund research using Research Coin. So um, it can start out as like very small, like single experiments. But over time, I think we'll be able to like show it's compelling that you can give people these like Research Coin grants and they'll be able to turn it into like reagents and materials used in an experiment in order to like actually produce some kind of like unit of knowledge. And so, yeah, I think like, First of all, curious if you guys are excited about an idea like that. And then if so, like within all of your given fields, like how much money do you think you'd need in order to like run one experiment that's like mildly interesting to people on the outside? Like maybe it's like a like a RNA seek or something like that. Um, yeah, just curious what everybody thinks they would need, like US dollar wise, in order to produce one result that could be published independently and also like uh, be interesting enough to make people stay on the page for a second and try and understand what's going on. Ricardo? Okay, yeah, so first of all, very excited about the idea. It's, it's great, actually. I think it's, it's a really great idea. Um, Couple of questions that I have. The first one is, if we're talking micro grants, uh, at least in my discipline, that is like wet chemistry, kind of like lab, wet wet <laughs> lab stuff. Um, I could see that being used for, like, for example, reagents. Um, a couple of reagents, a couple of materials, and you want to do a specific 
test and you, you just do the test. Um, but that would also mean that you should already have the, the, the equipment to, to, do the, to do the experiment. And that means that you're in a lab and you maybe have a PI that you're using the equipment for that research that is, let's say, published on research job. How do you think we could deal with that? Is there any work around or we should just focus on, I don't know, maybe social sciences or other kind of sciences that don't, do not involve uh, wet practices? Yeah, so so in my mind, I think we would want to limit it to editors, essentially, like people who are already involved in the community and like, you, you know, we already built a relationship with first. So, so I guess like kind of pushing that question back to you, Ricardo, like in theory, would your PI be OK with that? Or do you think that they would have an issue with you sharing like some you know, experimental result that you like derived on research hub. That's a good question. I don't know because I never, I never thought about this. But uh, yeah, probably depends on the PI. Uh, depend how flexible maybe your 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 research is. Because maybe if you want to do a small experiment, uh, maybe it makes sense to do something like isolated um, for for a specific purpose. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is definitely something that. We could maybe find a couple of people that could be interested and in just like talking to their PI and see which one approved the, the activity and go forward with that as a first example. Yeah, totally. And so the other kind of interesting part about this is we've released the new reward algorithm late last week. So now more research coin are being uh, distributed based on upvotes. And so if there's a novel piece of like research content that's shared to the ELN, I imagine it would get a lot of upvotes. So it's almost like uh, like it could be a source of you know like future resources for the lab or whoever shared it um, you know based on the research coin it actually earned as a post itself. So yeah, I think there's a lot of like cool ways that this could kind of like start a culture of people sharing content you know with the goal of like earning research like investing in like content in order to earn more based on how many upvotes it got. I guess uh, Nathan. Yeah, I, I, I've thought of one use case where, where this could work, and I, it could actually work in sort of integrated with the D-work bounties as well, which is that if people are familiar with systematic reviews and meta-analyses, a lot of that work require, doesn't require research infrastructure in the sense that you're looking at, especially if it's tabular meta-analysis, you're looking at existing studies that have been published. And really, the, the the amount of work is is churning through many many studies and applying a set uh, protocol that you've developed beforehand to all these studies. Now, you know, in theory, you could decentralize a meta analysis in the sense that you could come up with a protocol, publish that protocol, and then give make D work bounties for each paper that people went through, if that makes sense. And then they all submit it together and then you could have essentially a shared meta analysis on the topic. Yeah, that's super interesting. I like that a lot. Like D work bounties for shared work on a research output is super cool. I'm wondering, um, just like logistically, um, so, for example, if um, say I'm, I mean, I am a student, a grad student in a PI's lab, and I receive, I personally receive research coin through my account, and then I go to Uniswap and I swap it to USDC, um, and I wanted to go buy like some kind of reagent with that. Um, like, do I, as the student, have to network with um, like business operations at my university to say, hey, I'd I'd like to use my I don't know, my Coinbase debit card that has my USDC on it. I'd like to use that for purchasing. Am I allowed to do that? Is that like infringing on like the the funds of the um, like the PI? Does the PI need to go through those things? Should should a should a whole lab have an account on Research Hub as opposed to individuals um, so that the whole lab can earn um, research coin or value from the, the micro publication? I guess those are like some things that are top of mind. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think like this is where like the like infrastructure of doing this kind of funding could get complicated. And like I think it's worth trying to find out where the hiccups will be so that way we can like address them eventually. Um 
I'm not sure if anybody would be like willing to like introduce us to their PI, you know, like pitching this idea just to hear like their reservations or hesitations um, about the concept. Because, yeah, I do think it'll probably be a little bit more complicated than just giving someone, you know, X research coin to do something and like trying to figure out where those like hitches in the process are. I think I think it's worthwhile to do that exploration because it could be pretty cool uh, in the future if we have like significant resources behind the coin. Yeah, Edward. I'm just curious. Um, when we start talking about, you know, getting that kind of traffic, you know, the amount of money we have on Uniswap, I, I don't know what it is, uh, but you know, the what we have on Uniswap right now is useful. But like, I, I hear no talk about the the tokenomics. I guess like longer term, what gives research coin value? I mean, I, I don't know if you guys are thinking about it at all. And I mean, it seems like you probably are if you're talking about it, but I, I'm just completely clueless on that regard. And I wonder if that's something, um, you know, I just, I'm curious basically. Yeah, so to me, like uh, we got some feedback from one of Jeff's friends the other day that like there's there's no real like buy side pressure for research coin at the moment. Like there's a couple of like, you know, like weak utility use cases but to me, like the, the most compelling reason to have a coin uh, for a DSI project is for funding research projects. Like it's a, it's a gigantic marketplace where like really good researchers uh, have trouble getting funding. And so if you could do it in a better way, kind of like we think about fast grants a lot, um, the way they were able to fund COVID research studies with just like a five paragraph Google form. And then you'd have an answer on your grant like turned around within two weeks rather than like the typical like you know six to eight months of like a nih type of grant application and so yeah it seems like it would be like very reasonable to try and disrupt like the grant funding system both like nonprofits and kind of government grants and so sort of the concept behind this idea here is taking the first step towards giving that utility to research coin like, hey, if you want to fund a research study, you don't need to give your money to Susan G. Komen and put it into a black box where you're not really sure where it's going mm -hmm. and you don't really know how much of it's actually going to the researcher. Um, what you can do instead is buy some research coin and send it to the person uh, that you actually want to do the research study that you're interested in. And so, yeah, I think like the, the reason why this is interesting, I think on a small scale, like not you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, like just like 300 to $500, what we can manage right now with our liquidity is that we'll, we'll run into the roadblocks and start to figure them out. And so it's like almost like an exercise of, can we do this? And like, if we, you know, 300, 500 bucks, it's not a lot of money in terms of like academic science, but if we can prove that like reliably, we're able to give out these micro grants and actually have content come out of it, all of a sudden research coin has utility as like, a way to fund science, which is a whole lot of buy side pressure in theory, like when you look at like the research funding marketplace in general. And so, yeah, I think like the big picture reason why research coin, you know, would bring a lot of utility to science is helping to fund research projects. And that's like a lot like easier said than done. And so to me, it's worthwhile to start exploring, like, if we do do this, how do we do it? What are the roadblocks? How do we get around them? Like, how do we make it easy for the average person who wants to donate to Susan G. Komen to instead come to Research Hub and just fund breast cancer research like themselves, basically? Okay. Jeff? Yeah, I think it's like a compelling argument. Um, I think that like the, the pain point that's going to pop up um, is going to be that if you use research coin to fund, like if someone buys research coin to help support somebody um, through a grant that they want to fund, then that person then receives research coin and then immediately will have to liquidate it. So whoever bought it is going to have someone on the other end that's just going to liquidate it immediately to be able to buy whatever things that they need to have bought. So if we go down that route for research coin, then we need to be able to either allow research coin to be directly for um, like paying of reagents or allow research coin to be used as collateral where you can take out like a USD loan off of it. So you can use that 
um, as well, like for, for paying for the reagents. So I think like that's probably like, at, especially at scale is going to be like kind of, kind of difficult. And what I, what I would think would be a little bit better maybe would be if we use something like USD or USDC for paying of like the funding um, and the grants. But we integrate research coin as a way to govern maybe which grants people believe should receive the funding or govern um, how much money would go towards certain, for example. How valuable is how valuable is governance over that? I mean, first of all, you would you'd be talking about having to you know, be administering quite a lot of money for governance of that pot to have substantial value, right? You'd, be, you'd have to, like, you the, the market cap or not, the amount of USDC that we would have to be able to allocate mm -hmm. for, for governance of that to be, I mean, I suppose it would be over a period of time people could speculate over that, but for the governance token to actually have any kind of reasonable value, I would think that you would have to have substantial, you know, volume. And I, I would think that you would want more utility than that, just like off the top of my head. Yeah, it's tough because, well, you know, the value of research coin is going to fluctuate. And so if you're, if I received mm -hmm. a grant of 10,000 research coin, and then the next day my research coin was valued, you know, half of what it is on the day that I received it, you know, that's also difficult for like, paying for your reagents or paying for a, you know, a travel grant to do something, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking in the initial um, stage where I guess what, what this is sounding like is we're trying to find what product market fit for research coin at the moment, right? That, that's, that's what we're trying to do. And I think it, at the start, might it be worth exploring the niches where traditional funding doesn't seem to really cut it. So for example, at the moment, traditional funding is really linked to research output in traditional journals. And then you look at, well, what can you not publish so well in research journals? Well, you can't publish methods so well. They don't, they don't do so well in terms of citation score, et cetera. Your negative findings, they don't do so well. Is there a way in which we could incentivize those, you know, typically neglected areas that a lab will still be doing that they have the data for that they could publish and we could say actually you could get paid research coin to publish that on research hub and then we just need to find a way of making that interesting for readers on research hub yeah absolutely i, I think we can totally do that I, I guess uh in my mind the step process is like we do a small grant with like a you know grad student who has a pi like we, we figure out the hiccups that come out of that, right? And then once we feel comfortable with like the process that we, we know how to handle like the roadblocks that come out of like trying to fund research, then we start to target like, you know, negative studies or like we have a relationship with a quantum biology lab, right? Where they can't get funding from the NIH or NSF, but they have like private people who are interested in them. Um, so yeah, I guess like, I feel like this is very early stages in my mind. The idea is not fully formed at all. And like, I want to spend time like exploring it and figuring out like, you know, where the where the problems will be and ironing them out. So that way we can eventually like target like these niche fields of science that actually do need like a new way to get research funding. Um, th does that make sense? Does like order operations in your mind? Yeah, Nathan? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Patrick. I mean, it makes total sense to me. Like at at this stage, we we really should be, you know, exploring all all avenues and really just working out, you know, where the bumps in the road are, etc. I was just thinking, as as part of that sort of exploratory initial mission, so to speak, have we thought about having discussions with traditional academic funders and asking them, you know, what their challenges are and 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 what what are their frustrations when they're actually you know, um, working within the existing system and, and where they think it could be improved on? I had done some customer research like two years ago, like a very long time ago and spoke to like um, CZI and like Welcome Trust and a couple of them. And they were more excited about like the ability to uh, 
like get research funding to people outside of academia. Um, but you're absolutely right. Like doing doing more customer research, like with individuals, you know, who would actually want to buy research coin and potentially support stuff is pretty important. So yeah, we definitely need to do that if we want to like attract that kind of money to research coin eventually. Is there a way? Do you do you think is there a way to kind of like include like foundations that maybe want to you know get research coin to kind of like share the upside with like what is done with those research coins? Kind of like in, sort of like investment into the platform and what is done on the platform. Do you think there's something that could be explored in that sense with some foundations that maybe don't? I don't know. Could like uh, use research up to get more uh, content out. I don't know. I mean, I, I absolutely think so. We have to be like careful about how we position it because things like shared upside stuff like that, like it's like, yeah, it, it's better to be like pitching a way to fund research than necessarily like, um, yeah, we just have to be careful about how we say it officially. Um, but yes, absolutely. I think it makes a ton of sense. And I think that um, like when I spoke with uh, CZI years ago uh, for the first thing I was working on, they, that's kind of how they saw it as well. Like it was like, yeah, shared upside with the ability to use it for something, you know, a couple of years down the road. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think like forward thinking, um, like funders would absolutely be into that. I think like the Foresight Institute, like they do a good job of doing like kind of small grants. And I bet that they have scientists they would want to support and like they you know, are familiar with us and our mission, kind of like the long-term goals. So yes, totally. If we're very careful about how we like market it, then for sure. Okay, so just for the sake of time, since we have about 10 minutes to go, we have one final topic. Um, and that is um, another one um, from Patrick um, and I'll let him elaborate as well, but um, this will be kind of trying to stress test the ELN feature to see just how many people um, can be on one uh, ELN, shared ELN and how, how many people and what you can post um, that can still be sustained by that, um, by the ELN. Yeah, so the goal here is uh, Ricardo and Anton Bauman have been working hard trying to put together like a SciComm hackathon, you know, for, for lack of a better term, where we're essentially going to get a bunch of people to have like a competition um, about like uh, basically sharing their own research outputs, like blogs about like different topics they're interested in, and then videos about like their own research. And so it, I'm not sure if everybody here is on a computer. But it'd be it'd be cool if we could all try and get onto the same uh, um, ELN note and like all try and type in at once just to see if it like has the ability to support uh, multiple people at once using the platform. So um, I think everybody here is invited to the editor um, ELN organization. There's like an outreach strategy, um, which is at the top of mine. Um, I'll share a link here. Yeah, a couple people jumping in now. I'll put it in the uh, the chat here too. I guess, Kobe, is there anything specific that you think we should do to try and uh, like break the ELN here? Um, I think um, just trying to edit at the same time would be very nice. Cool. Yeah, it looks like we've got like six or seven people in there now. Thank you, guys. I think not everyone is invited. I'm actually, I don't know if I'm invited myself because I'm getting a four or three. Okay. Here, I'll I don't think I am. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll invite you guys. Let me grab this. Maybe you can copy Joyce the, uh, you know, in Google Calendar. You can like copy. There's like a button to copy like all the emails. Oh yeah, good call. And, uh, Seems to work fine. The only thing is that it's probably kind of a little bit kind of slow to to reload when you kind of like kind of reload. But apart from that, looks good. 
Yeah, Pat and Thomas seem pretty confident that we'd be able to handle a whole bunch of people on it. So, I mean, to me, if we have like six people in a note, like that's pretty good. Like, I, I don't think that'll happen. Like that many people in one note. Ricardo, what do you think? Yeah, so something that I noticed when I was working with Anton on this is um, when he was on the page, um, it was difficult for me to, not really difficult, but like when I was switching between uh, pages within a workspace, sometimes I was getting, uh, I was clicking to the other page and I was getting the, the blank page with no error. And I was kind of like reloading and the, the kind of like the, the load um, symbol was kind of like keep on spinning. Uh, that happened a couple of times. Uh, but right now it's not happening. Like it's loading just fine. So maybe it could have been just a problem that occurred that day. So yeah, we. I think it's a good practice to kind of like every once in a while meet and stress test the ELN to see any update, what could that bring. Yeah, it's, it seems to be working pretty well. So yeah, thanks everybody for jumping in. And uh, if you ever notice any issues with this, let, let us know, because we plan on, I think, trying to use it a lot more over the next month or two. And so yeah, the, the more issues we find, uh, the better we'll be for when we actually have like a bunch of grad students coming in trying to create content. Okay, well, um, yeah, so that's like everything that was on the itinerary for the day. Um, is there any other topics anyone wants to bring up or anything miscellaneous that we can do in the last five minutes or so? I'm just curious, um, Pat, what are some of the limitations that you guys have run into because of securities regulations? Oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> infinity of them. Like, you just have to be ridiculously careful all the time and not really have any clarity on like what you can and can't do. It, it's funny because we've even had like, um, we've been working with the same law firm for the last three years and they, um, like one of their crypto specialists ends up getting hired by FTX as their like, uh, you know, general counsel. And then the second one ended up getting hired by another cool company. And the recommendations change with each uh, attorney who's advising us. So yeah, it's just, there's a real lack of clarity on what you can and can't do, um, what you can and can't say. And so like even with our tokenomics stuff, like, yeah, just the advice has changed a lot over the past like two or three years. And so like, if you want to like, you know, get on a non-recorded call, I'm happy to like go into a little bit more detail. Around it. But yeah, the, the legal situation around like how you try and like, de-risk um, your token from a securities perspective is like pretty complicated. But like at the end of the day, it comes down to Howie's test, which I'm sure you're familiar with is like the, there's like four prongs. Um, yeah. yeah. One of the prongs. Yeah. So um, I'll be uh, posting about this later, but a friend of mine is working with a company that I actually think found a way around most of those. And I, I was just curious the extent to which that was a problem for us. But yeah, cool. It's one of those things where it's like, you can never know. Because like they choose enforcement actions kind of like two or three years down the road. So like, no, they actually went to the SEC and some other regulatory bodies like the Spanish Central Bank and talked to them about it and they agreed with them. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's I, I'll post about it later. Very cool. Yeah, that, that'd be super helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I guess for the last five minutes, does anybody have any other uh, feedback or ideas for us to think about over the next week or two? Oh, also uh, the NFT thing. When are we setting up like a structured conversation for that? So NFTs, we're building a peer review feature right now, which should be shipped um, sometime in the next like two to four weeks. And so mm -hmm. after that would be NFTs when we start thinking about like things from like a design product perspective. So yeah, I would probably not in the next two weeks maybe mm -hmm. at the end of the following sprint and then after a month definitely so yeah if, if you have ideas feel, feel free to ping me and like we would definitely jump on a call and start brainstorming but like we'll, we'll start doing like official product thoughts and designs probably in about a month okay cool uh Malik? yeah while, while we are on the, uh, the topic about legal counsel i just wanted to revisit something that i had asked um you know, when I first joined um, Research Hub like a few months ago at this point is um, like, you know, like if I share like 
an abstract only from a from an article that is uh, not open open access. I just shared the the abstract, and then all of a sudden there is a discussion going on on that, and there is like tokens exchange back and forth, like for good you know comments and stuff. Um, I mean, right now we have only like you know few articles per. Like, I mean, my hub is really small, dermatology, like, you know, there are a few articles and if any, you know, anybody, you know, says, oh, this cannot be posted, then we can remove it. But like once down the line, a year or two years down the line, when there will be like thousands of papers, um, do you foresee like any of the big publication houses like causing any trouble because it would, it is like abstract is like openly available, but we are using it quote unquote for commercial, like because we're getting tokens. Um, do, do, do you get my question? Yeah, totally. And, and so my current understanding is that sharing abstracts fall under something called fair use, which is since the journal essentially shares it openly um, before a paywall, others are allowed to do that as well. Um, things that wouldn't qualify under this are like figures, like if figures aren't exposed before the paywall. Um, so in theory, my understanding is that abstracts are fair game because journals essentially like uh, show them before they have a paywall. Um, in the future, I think it's definitely likely that uh, a journal might try and like get us in trouble legally. Um, what would happen there is we have like a DMCA takedown request. So like on YouTube, right? Like when you try and upload a video, they automatically scan to see if there's any copyright violation. And if there is, uh, the copyright holder can basically ping YouTube and say, hey, you need to take this down via DMCA request. And so that's the process of what would happen uh, at Research Hub. And like Research Hub is the one responsible for taking it down. So we have that within our help section right now that like if a copyright holder wanted us to take down a paper, we have the infrastructure for that and we can do it. Um, we, we're obviously like proactively not trying to violate any copyright laws though. So um, yeah. With that being said, my understanding is abstracts are totally fair game and that there are a bunch of websites right now that are openly sharing abstracts of like paywalled content. Oh, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, yeah Nick. Uh, Patrick, your answer actually just covered what I was going to ask. So we're good. Well, do, do, do you mind saying it anyway, though, just so I can get a temperature of like what people are thinking about? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was, I was just curious about the, um, just in the future with money being exchanged hands, you know, because of a paper that may be posted on a journal, the, the implications of that once this platform grows a lot. So pretty much similar to Malik's concern, um, just in that, just making sure that's something we, you know, when we do expand more and more and more, it's something we would run into. So just to reiterate, to make sure I've got it now, I'll check with our attorneys. Um, in theory, like there's a concern that fair use may not apply if there's like financial value being exchanged because of the content. Yeah, yeah, I've, like I've heard of, I don't know how broad the language is on what is fair use and what isn't and whether there could be some sort of um, technicality that we could run into that um, because of that. Yeah, That's I think all. it's probably worth being very safe there. So so I'll run this past our attorneys and get back to you guys with like the paragraph that they send back explaining it. Okay, great. All right, well, that's about the end of the time. Uh, so thank you everyone for, for coming in for this week and we'll have another one uh, next week. And uh, I believe that's gonna be the one with the, uh, the answer view. Um, so that one will be an exciting one. All right, everyone, have a good one. Thanks Thank everybody. you. Bye.